Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank God for each one of you. I want to remind you what we are in that season of collecting the Eliza Broad Estate Missions offering. And we especially think of what has happened in West Kentucky in the last year with the tornado. We think about uh, the flooding in East Kentucky. We think about various uh, agencies and missions groups and ministries that have reached out to help in the recovery efforts there. And so what you give through the state missions offering is used in part uh, for them and for the work of disaster relief, as well as other missions groups across uh, the state of Kentucky who take these gifts that they receive from the 2,400 churches in the Kentucky Baptist Convention and apply those uh, to the work of the gospel. And so thank you for your generosity. We have about $318.25 to go until we reach and exceed our goal. And so uh, if you would continue to pray about that and, and consider what you are able uh, to give. Well, today is one of those special days in the life of our school because we have preaching for us today one of our senior students. And so today is the senior chapel service for Brother Phoenix Antis. And uh, Brother Phoenix became a, a part of our church when he first got here and means a lot to the folks at East Barberville. And we've loved uh, the three, uh, over three years that we've got to spend with him to get to know him when I think of Brother Phoenix, I think of Luke chapter 9, verse 62, when Jesus said that no man having put his hand to the plow and looketh back is fit for the kingdom of God. And I think of Phoenix for this reason, because of one word, and that word is perseverance. And so, uh, Brother Phoenix, I, I think you have been a picture of or definition of the word perseverance. And coming into campus this morning, I, I was listening to uh, someone who gave this statistical figure. 42% of those who are in vocational ministry right now in the season we are in are contemplating walking away, not from where they are currently serving, but walking away from ministry, period. And so perseverance is a big deal. As a matter of fact, everybody say perseverance. Perseverance. <laughs> And I've seen this young man of God. I have seen him persevere through times and seasons of personal disappointment. I've seen you stay the course and overcome those obstacles and those odds. I've seen him persevere through seasons of financial hardship as a college student at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College, one who's trying to earn his way, uh, pay his way as he goes. I've seen him persevere in his studies at times when it would have been convenient and perhaps easier just to quit and to go back. Uh, rather, he stayed the course and kept his hand to the plow. And for that, I'm grateful. And I believe that that will pay great dividends for him in his ministry. We have had a lot of laughs together as he was a part of our praise team. And uh, boy, I tell you, we didn't get much done in those times that our praise team uh, <clears throat> was practicing. But we did laugh a lot and have a lot of great fellowship. And he and I have had a lot of conversations uh, about the Lord and about the church and, and what uh, God is doing and can do. And so let me just congratulate you and say that you're almost there. And so keep your hand on the plow, stay the course, not just in your studies, but in your service to the Lord now and forevermore. With that said, we want to pray together today, and our praise team will come and lead us before the throne in worship. Father, we thank you. We praise you for this day. I thank you for every student, every faculty member, all of our staff who are gathered in this place. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just move and work among us today, that we may experience you, your presence and your power on display in our lives through the worship of your name, through the singing of your praises. Father, I pray you would meet and needs that are in every heart and every life in this place today. Lord, we know you are Jehovah Jireh. You're Jehovah Rapha, Father. And Lord, we worship you as such. So Lord, speak to us here in this place. Let us meet with you and be transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Clear Creek, good to be back with you again for chapel. Let's stand and worship our Savior together. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who 
shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. for all that you've done for me. Amen. Give the Lord praise, church. And now as we come to our time of prayer, I pray that you guys remember that every song that we sing is to the audience of one. It's to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that amazing grace that he gave to us on Calvary still runs through that blood today. And we're, after prayer time, going to sing that wonderful contemporary hymn called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. I have never reached the end or the bottom of the gloriousness of the Word of God. And I pray that you haven't either. And I know with the second half of the semester, it's easy for us to get distracted with all the assignments to do. But take time to pause and be still before the Lord and dive into that mystery of His glorious Word, of that salvation that came from Calvary. With that in mind, join me sitting, standing, or coming to this altar, and let us pray.
Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. And come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man, in his living, in his suffering, never trace nor stain of sin, see the truth. way 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we do pray that you will guide us when we can't see, that you will lead us, for you are all that we need. And God, now as we enter into this time through worship through your word, Lord, be on Brother Phoenix, help him bring the word, have said what you want to be said, and give you all the glory and praise for it. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray this, amen. Amen. Am I on? We got it? Okay. <laughs> wow, that was uh, that was fast. That was a that was a quick three years. I did not expect it to go that. God, bear with me, please. <laughs> um, wow, I, I can't believe that we're already here, and I can't believe how much the Lord has done for me. No, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> okay. Oh. People are going to come up and think Dr. Fox is preaching after they see everything all over the, all the tears coming down. Oh, well, Josh had a lot of things to say about me that I didn't expect. Honestly, I expected him to start embarrassing me and all that stuff. And well, I guess I'll, I'll tell the embarrassing story myself. So, um, I do want to thank Josh and I, and East Barberville and for all that they had done for me, have done for me throughout my time here at Clear Creek. And uh, funny thing, um, one of Josh's first experiences with me was the week of orientation. And this is just a little knock on my na naivete at the time. I'm still pretty oblivious now. Um, we were at the church dinner. Uh, for uh, that that week, you know how we have all that. We have our church churches will host the freshmen and whatnot. And Josh got up and he was speaking, talking to us. And I noticed something because I'm ADHD. My eyes are going all over the place. And I noticed, uh, and I didn't know how to control my mouth at the time. 
Still really don't now, but that's better now then. And so I'm like, hey, Josh, in the middle of him talking to us, your fly's down. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, no, here we go. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, he hates me, and I know he does. It's in his heart. He covers it up with that big, big uh, preacher smile and them little hands, but I know he hates me. I know he hates me. And when we're still talking about my churches that I've been in and, you know, been blessed by, I would like to thank, I, I believe he's watching right now, uh, one Dwayne Rains um, and uh, Calvary Baptist Church of Piketon, Ohio, for <laughs> all that he had invested in me and he has invested in me and all that the church had done for me and all the people there and that youth group and uh, all the families that took me in and helped me out when I was, you know, young and still, I still am young, but I was younger and a very, very baby believer. And I want to just thank him for all that he's done for me and for the mentorship that he's given me. And I, uh, he's not here this morning, but I would also like to thank Dr. Diddy and uh, Pump Springs Baptist Church for taking me in um, this uh, just this summer and into, you know, this last semester. For some reason, the Lord said, <laughs> my last semester, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to leave the church you've been at your entire time at Clear Creek, and now it's, I'm putting you here. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Diddy, uh, if he's watching, and all, all the members of Pump Springs for being so welcoming to me. And uh, while we're talking about churches and professors, I would also like to thank uh, my professors for investing so much in me. And I'd like to thank Dr. Nix uh, for all the time that we've had in uh, our little one-on-one -on -one musicianship classes and all the times that we've had, you know, him counseling me and helping me out. And uh, Dr. Burton is, wasn't able to be here today. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Burton for giving me some wise counsel, though, I mean, that is his job, so I hope he does it well. I hope it's wise, but <laughs> I'd like to thank him as well. Um, and Dr. Goodman is also not here this morning because, you know, he's decided that it's more important to take a break and be at the beach than to come, you know, be a professor. I mean, honestly, what kind of guy does that? Uh, he's a pretty good man, though. Um, i also like to thank some of my friends. Um, we'll go... <laughs> Some people are going to think I'm going to miss them, but I'm going to get to them in a bit. I'd like to thank Nathaniel Potter. Where are you at, Nathaniel? There he is, all the way in the back, back row Baptist, for being an awesome friend, uh, great friend, and um, investing in me and uh, praying with me through uh, hard times. I'd like to thank uh, Levi Thomason. Where are you at? I know you're here somewhere. There you are. I'm <laughs> blind. The tears are coming up for exact same thing. And if he's watching, I'd like to thank Dakota Garrett as well. And uh, Luke, Luke and Maria Mansfield for investing all their time in me and being great friends to me, just being really a blessing in my life. I'd like to thank uh, Jonathan Foster. He's, yeah, I don't know where he's at. There he is. Uh, you're, you're getting ready to go through something crazy too, aren't you? Getting ready to get married. That's, that's wild. Uh, I'd like to thank Tyler Coco for being a great friend and for just investing prayers and time in me and, you know, building me up and helping me build him up. I'd like to thank Dylan Mason for just being a, an absolute Chad, absolute man, um, and a great friend. I'd like to thank Curtis Fury, Scott Saunders, and all the nerds. Lord have mercy, I couldn't name them all if I could. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, therefore, I couldn't name them all if I could. Well, eh, oh, anyway. And uh, countless others who have spent their time pouring into me and um, helped me grow and helped me mature in my faith. Oh, yeah, there's also this other guy. Uh, his name is Cole Berkheimer and his awesome wife, Emily, more recently uh, for just, <laughs> it's uh, been a long nine years. <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you a story about Cole. Oh, um, he thinks I'm going to embarrass him, but I'm not. I'll save that for later. Um, <laughs> when uh, my father passed away, when I was uh, 12 in sixth grade, it was like the week I had come back. And I went down, and I sat down in a field at recess. And uh, this guy right here, 12 years old, came up and sat down beside me. And he just said, I'm sorry for what happened. 
I don't know. I don't know you really well, but I'm sorry for what happened. I just want to know that I care about you. And that was it. That's all he said. And we just sat there. And he's been there for me ever since. And it's been, he, this, this guy's the first one to invite me to church. And, uh, you know, he's one of some really important people in my life who've helped me and guided me towards Christ. And I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Cole and others. And I want to thank my, my mom if she's watching. She said she would be, but <laughs> with the kids, I don't know if she can. Um, I thank my mom and the rest of my family for investing in me and uh, helping raise me. But most of all, I would like to thank God and the Lord Jesus for giving everything to me. Everything that I never could have asked for. And I'd like to give him all the glory for all the time I've spent here, every time I've given, been given an opportunity to do his work. I'd like to give him all the glory for that. And, oh man. I'd like to thank him for giving us his church and for all the people here in this room. I know someone in one way or another. I probably missed some, not thanking. Um, but I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being awesome and being, investing in me and just helping me in my time here. And speaking of the church, I would like everyone, if they can, to turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. We'll be looking in verses 12 through 17, and as you're turning there, I know we've had an education in this, but some of us have not gotten, uh, not quite gotten to NT3 and NT4 yet, so I'll just, I'll give some background on Colossians uh, real quick. We know that Colossians is one of the prison epistles. Uh, it's one of the prison epistles that Paul wrote while he was, guess where, in prison. And uh, uh, some people say Rome, some people say other places other than Rome while he, that he was in prison. Um, we know that uh, Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians were the other prison epistles. And we think of uh, the book of Philippians where he's telling us to rejoice. Rejoice again, I say, I say rejoice in prison. Like, that's it. That is absolutely insane. When we get to Colossians, and Paul, he never went to the church of Colossae. The, the closest he had been was uh, to the church of Ephesus. Uh, and uh, the church in Colossae sprout up, sprouted up as an, a little bit of a shootout from the church in Ephesus. Now, Paul had heard something that was going around in Colossae and other churches in the region that it was a bit of a heresy. We would call it, some would call it proto-Gnosticism. It's this, uh, for those who don't know what that means, uh, Gnosticism is this sort of mystic, you know, we have the secret, uh, this, we have the secret word that God has given us, something, some big mystery. But the point that Paul makes is that the mystery has been revealed. That's the point of a revelation. That's revealing something. He says, Christ is superior above all human wisdom all mysteries, all secret words. He says, Christ is superior. He is above it all. There are no, it's all been revealed to us. And then when we're moving here into chapter three, he's addressing the problems of their hearts. This stuff wouldn't be happening if they weren't holding on to the things of the flesh or holding on to those works of the flesh. We see earlier in uh, chapter three where Christ is, uh, where uh, Paul is telling them, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. That is set in heaven, not that on earth. Don't look at your secret wisdom. Don't look at your secret mysteries. Seek Christ because he is the one who is above. Seek heaven. Seek God. But we get here in, uh, later in the chapter, we're coming to a point where he says, therefore, put to death that, is which, that which is of the earth. Put, to, put away these things. Put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now put it away. Put it all away. And now we come here to verse 12, where Paul is now speaking what to put on. We've taken off these dumb, ugly, gross, fleshly clothes, these filthy rags, these bloody, bloody clothes that we have. Now Paul's like, well, now 
not wear anything. God put something on. And so he says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were called in one body, rule your hearts. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you would please pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Everything that you have brought all of us through, Lord, we know that every single one of us has struggled. God, I wanna thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy. I want to thank you for fellowship and for the love that you've shown to us. God, I want to thank you for this word that you've given us, this this truth you didn't need to give us. But Lord, you guide us through everything. When we can't see, you guide us. Lord, lead us. You are all that we need. And Lord, I ask that you open my mouth to preach your word. Remove me and any words that would come from my flesh from this message. And Lord, let me be a megaphone for you. Let it only be you speaking this this morning. And God, thank you so much for everything that you do. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Now, we see here that Paul has given these exhortations to the Colossians. You know, we've put off all of these things. We've put to death our sexual immorality, our lust, our impurity. We put to death all of these things. But now he says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, Jeremy, what's the therefore, therefore? Right. Exactly. So we're taught, of course, understand what our uh, conjunctions are. We're taught to understand the text. We're taught to understand the words. So The Bible says, therefore, we're looking back in the context of what we were just talking about earlier. We're looking at how we're putting to death all these things. Therefore, now, put on these things. So we put to death all the things that had God's wrath on us. Yet we'll notice here in verse 12, we have this, therefore, we look at these qualities. It says, as God's chosen ones. Now, that word here, that chosen one, that still refers back to, it's a similar word in the Greek to the word that, that is Christ. It's a similar word to that. It's something that is attributed to Christ. As God's chosen ones, we are the chosen ones of God. Only in scripture do we see the Messiah referred to as chosen, the anointed one. And now he's calling us anointed, chosen by God. Because God has, a, God himself came to earth, lived his life. He fulfilled his mission. Now he's come back. He said, it's finished. Now I choose you to do the work. Now we are chosen by God. I choose you to do the work that you've given us. Well, that I've given you. He said, holy and dearly loved. Again, in scripture, this, these words in the Greek are almost always referring to Christ until this point. Holy and dearly loved. Because Christ came, lived and died, we've, we know the gospel. I hope we do. We're, we're, at, we're at Clear Creek. I hope that we know the gospel. We know that Christ humbled himself to the point of death, being uh, even to death on a cross, taking on our sins. He, he, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that uh, through him we might attain the righteousness of God. Now we are holy if we are in Christ. Now we have the fruits of the spirit if we are in Christ. We talk about the fruits of the spirit. Um, These aren't things that are, we often get those mixed up with spiritual gifts. No, the fruits of the spirit are fruits that the spirit produces. If I am in Christ, I have peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, goodness, and self-control. I have all of those things. Because I am a believer and I am in Christ, I have the fruits of the Spirit. They aren't gifts that are specifically given to one or another. If I am in Christ, I have self-control. If I am in Christ, I have peace. I have patience. And now Paul is telling us, 
Put those things on. We are holy and loved by God. Now, put on compassion. Love others. This compassion, uh, literally we're, uh, here, I believe, is the word oikteros, uh, which is probably something I have just butchered in the Greek. But it's, uh, that's the word we translate compassion from here. And that is literally a divine wisdom. A, well, not a divine compassion, not divine wisdom, excuse me. A divine compassion that we are to put on as believers in Christ. We, he says, put on the compassion of God. The compassion that God had on all of us when he, when he humbled himself to the point of being obedient to the, well, humbled, he humbled himself and being obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That kind of love that saw the wickedness and sinfulness and helplessness of man, he said, I'm going to step in and I'm going to be their su substitution. I'm going to be their sacrifice. I'm going to step in. Now Paul's saying, put that on. Now you got to do it. This is you. We see with every single word here, this kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, that they all have in the, in the original text, origin, the original Greek, a divine sort of connotation. We see that this is the kindness that God had, the humility that God has, the kindness that God has, humility that God has, the gentleness that God has, the patience that God has. That kindness is the same kind of kindness that Peter showed to the soldier uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane when Peter went and cut off his ear. And Jesus said, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm putting it back on. That kindness, that the, the one, that sort of humility, when we look at this humility here, the kind of humility of a man who is Lord, who is God over everything, got down on his knees and he said, I'm going to wash the feet of the one who's going to put me into the hands of those who put me on the cross. He sold me for 20 pieces of silver. I'm going to wash his feet. I'm going to wash the feet of those who deny me. Three crows later. Then on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And I'm going to pay the debt for all of them. That all they have to do is repent and believe in me. All they have to do from that point on, that sort of humility. I think of, uh, when going back to kindness, I think of, um, have any of you done the polar plunge in here? Raise your hand if you've done the polar plunge. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. Um, yeah, I see the ones who did it with me and I don't, see, I don't see anyone else really. Okay, so that was a nightmare. That was awful, I'm never doing that again. Why do we do that? We should ban that. Actually, I don't know why we do that, but when we did the polar plunge, we were all, uh, it was, you know, cold. It was cold outside. And then getting into a t-shirt and shorts, getting ready to plunge into a freezing creek. Like I said, we should ban that. That is stupid. Anyways, <laughs> don't let me do that again. <laughs> um, uh, it was, I think it was me, Cole, Megan, and Caleb. Was there anybody else? No? Okay. So I was the first to get in. I was the last one out, I believe. I believe I was the last one out. And so I got in. I was in my little slides because I was stupid. Got in. I'm like, hmm, this is pretty warm. Why is it warm? That's all the heat leaving my body. And so when we go in, we all dive in. I'm in shock. I, don't, I can't breathe. All I can think in my head is this primitive thought, leave, 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 get out of here. I don't even notice that my shoes are gone. Like, I've, well, I've lost one. I don't know what happened to it, but one is coming off my foot and I get it. But I'm like, oh no, where's the other one? And I see in front of me is Cole, the last one to get in and the first one to get out <laughs> because he's smart. He sees my shoe that had been, you know, drifting away. Unfortunately, Caleb could not recover his, but Cole was kind enough and watching his brother's back to be like, oh, I'm gonna I'm grab this without even thinking. Without even thinking, he just grabbed the shoe, took it, and here we are. That sort of kindness that we're not even thinking about ourselves in that situation, but we're like, oh, now he's in a situation where he can't do this himself. Oh, so I'm available. I'm going to go get it. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 to consider others in humility, consider others more important than yourselves. And I know Cole in that moment had that compassion, that kindness to consider me 
as more important than him in that situation. I lost my shoes. I wouldn't, I, but I got my shoes back. And that was, yeah. <laughs> like, you have a brother that'll stand and be there for you. And that's what we should be for each and every one of one another. Now we move from this kindness, this gentleness, this compassion to forgiveness. Paul goes on further delving into those divine attributes when talking about this forgiveness. He instructs us to forgive us as Christ has forgiven us. To forgive one another, bear with one another as Christ forgave us. And that's not only a why, that's a command. If we're in Christ, we have to forgive. We can choose to disobey a command, don't get me wrong, but we must forgive if we are in Christ. But this isn't the, the, just a command, this is the how you do it. How did Christ forgive you and me? He didn't wait for us to come to him on judgment day, sitting on the throne and say, all right, what you got for me? You're gonna beg for forgiveness from here now? He said, the, like we've talked about it again and again, Christ himself came, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He took the form of a slave, bearing, taking on flesh, coming down, bearing our sins, and came to me. He came to me. And that's what we're supposed to do for one another. Jesus says in uh, Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, that if you find yourself at the altar, but you realize that you have ought against your brother, go leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother. Luke flips it around in, the, in, a, in a similar passage where Jesus says, if you go to offer your gift at the altar, but you realize your brother has ought against you, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and offer your gift to God. It doesn't matter who did what, who was in the wrong. If I wronged somebody, I, I am to go and ask for, for, their, for, for, for their forgiveness. If somebody has wronged me, I am to go and to offer them forgiveness. Uh, Paul says to outdo one another in doing good. Put it off. Put to death our pride. Put to death our immorality. Put it to death in humility, go humble yourself and say, hey, I wronged you or you wronged me. Let's fix this because we cannot worship together in such a manner. And um, reading through that and thinking about that, that Christ came to us when we had wronged him, that's humbling in and of itself. How often have I found myself in a situation where, you know, he said this, this, and this about me. I'll wait to him, wait for him to come to me. Uh, you know, when you wait for somebody to come to you to ask their forgiveness, that doesn't happen unless they're a really strong believer. <laughs> and so all of this is found in, Christ, in that love that Christ soon, well, that Paul soon commands us to have. We see in verses 14 through 15 here, and Paul tells us, and the Colossians, then by extension, you and I, to put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now, that word for love, we know that word to be agape, and everyone and their mother, and at least in this, in, in this area, in this church, not this church, this chapel, knows what agape is. It's that godly love, that sacrificial love, that love that says, I don't care what you've given to me, I will give all to you, that love that God himself has for us. And now he says, put it on. It's the perfect bond of unity. Now that word for bond of unity is, it's one word. We have three words in our English, but there's only one word. That word is syndesmos. Syndesmos is a word that literally means tendon or sinew. It's a something that binds us and binds our body together. And in verse 15, he goes on, Paul goes on to talk about how we were called in one body. Love is the, the tendon that binds the entire body together. If the church doesn't have love, we're a body without any tendons, out, without any ligaments. I myself, has anyone in here like torn uh, something like playing sports, torn like a, like a, had a Tommy John injury, something like that, or, you know, slipped and fallen when you're walking into the chapel, uh, well, walking into the fo foyer into the chapel but after it was raining, didn't wipe your shoes off, now you slip and fall, and now your knee is like in this way, your leg's out that way. 
So I tore something my freshman year, and that was rough. But I, without that, I tore this right here. It's my MCL. I, my MCL. I sprained it, tore it, something like that. Regardless, I couldn't walk. I tried to hobble around on crutches. I was doing more, I was, it was more dangerous for me to walk around on crutches than me normally walking regardless. So Dr. Diddy in his grace and mercy gave me a wheelchair um, and that was also a nightmare. I don't wanna talk about it. But <laughs> um, without one ligament in my body, I was, a, I was a burden to everybody around me. Without one ligament in my body, I was pointless and useless. A body without any ligaments is a useless meat sack on the floor. Without anything, without anything connecting us together as the church, without love, we are nothing better than a pile of jelly and bones. We're, we're nothing. The church can't move. The church can't do anything if the church has no love for one another. If we are disunified and have no unity in the body, then we're not going to be able to do the work that Christ has given, for, uh, given to us. There is nothing that we can do if we don't have love for one another. There's nothing that we can do if I am not willing to go to my brother and correct them, or if I'm not willing to allow my brother to come to me and correct me, if I'm not willing to bear with my brother whenever he is in trials, if I'm not willing to bear with my sister when she is in trials, if they are not willing to bear it with me, the church is not going to move. We have to love one another because one, why wouldn't we? Because Christ gave all that to us. He loved us first. But two, we're gonna fall apart. What's the point? What's the point without love? What's the point without being obedient to God in that way? And so we move forward. We think about, excuse me. I need to get a drink of water, excuse me. Mm. We think about 1 Corinthians chapter 13. At the beginning of the chapter, Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And what does he go on to say next there in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all wrongs. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Uh, it's not self-centered. It's not rude or selfish. It doesn't rejoice in sin, but it rejoices in truth. The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. In love, there is nothing dividing us. But if we don't have love for one another, we aren't unified. And if we don't have love for one another to just shut up and love, like, just be unified. If I don't get out of the way, and if I don't consider others more important than myself, as Paul says, we're not going to move. There's not going to be anything for us. If we have not love, then we are nothing. I'm just like the Pharisees who are praying aloud in the street, asking to be heard. So let's start lifting one another up. Confront one another when we sin in gentleness. That's something I, f I find myself often lacking is that gentleness. I find my, I feel like I'll, I'll be like, man, I'm, I, can, I can see is wrong. Let me get the log out of my eye. Okay, now, oh, now I'm not being gentle. <laughs> now I've gone to the person who has done wrong or wronged me or I have wronged, I'm still not being gentle about it. Peter says to do all these things, to uh, always have um, a reason for the hope that is in you and to defend it with gentleness. If Paul talks about here having gentleness in verse 12, if we're not gentle with one another, then we're going to, like I say offend, I don't mean offend as in the blue haired feminist kind of offend. I mean offend as in the, I'm going to put my uh, brother away from me kind of offend. You know, you don't care enough to me to at least be kind to me. Sure, you can see everything I'm doing wrong, but let's bring, uh, bring one another up, build one another up in gentleness. I can tear somebody down all I want, and they will know, like, yeah, you're right. I do all these things wrong, but now what do I do? I have nothing for them. I have no 
constructive criticism. I have nothing to build them up. I speak, you know, uh, we talk about in uh, biblical counseling how we need speech that builds up, not that foul language that only tears down. We need speech that can build one another up. If I can't go to my brother and say, hey, this is, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Let me help you. Let me pray for you. Let me do this. Then we're not showing love for one another and we're not going to be unified in one body. We're not going to be dwelling on the word of God. We're not going to be obedient to what God has said. And uh, the Bible says here in verse 15 of chapter three, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body rule your hearts and be thankful. If we're not letting that peace rule us, we're not gonna be getting anywhere. If we're not gonna be ruled by God's peace, we're not gonna be getting anywhere. If we're not thankful for what God has done for us, how are we gonna be thankful about one another? The Bible says in 1 John how can I love God? How can I say that I love God if I've not loved my brother who I have seen? If I've not loved my God who I don't see? Well, well if I, I can't say I love God who I haven't seen if I don't love my brother who I have seen. Now, how do we do that? How do we get to that love? We can start by letting the word dwell richly among us here in verse 16. We're finding the application now, getting into what we need to do as the church. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The first thing for love is letting the word of Christ dwell in us. That living word. It lives in us. If we can't find reason to love one another, then we're not looking hard enough. If I can't recall that scripture that says, hey, love your brother, love your enemy, we're not reading, we're not dwelling on the word that God has given us. We're not thinking about the gospel that Jesus Christ came to die for you and I in that kind of love. We look at this worship from support, admonishing, and teaching one another. If I'm not taking the word to my brothers when I go and build them up or tear, what, tear their pride down to then build up their humility and kindness and gentleness, if I'm not taking the word to them, then there's, I've not given them anything. I'm, getting, I'm building their house for them on sinking sand. We were just talking about in OT, yesterday, Old Testament 7 yesterday, how uh, the Dome of the Rock was built on bedrock, a foundation, but the mosque that's next to it is built on some pillars. And so every earthquake that has come through there has absolutely destroyed the mosque next to it. But the Dome of the Rock, which was built on that foundation, still stands today. That mosque has been broken by God time and time again, but the Dome of the Rock has stood because it's been built on a solid foundation. Therefore, let you and me build one another up on the solid foundation of the word of God. And when we look to giving gifts and supporting others' ministries, singing with gratefulness to God, that, that is, all of that is evidence of your heart and the state of my heart whenever we're trying to worship together. Paul says to sing with gratefulness to God. And Paul says to do all in the name of Christ. And this gives thanks to the Father. One example of this sort of uh, worship and fellowship is uh, found in a book called Extreme Devotion. It's like a sequel to that uh, Jesus Freaks, uh, the book, not the, the awesome song. Um, it's a story kind of like Fox Book of Martyrs. It's a collection of stories of martyrdom or just stories of missionaries in hard times. And there was a missionary, the book left him unnamed, went to North Korea undercover as a sort of businessman, and he was going to find an underground church and fellowship with them. And a friend of his had packed a box gift in his suitcase, and he told this missionary that he, should, he would know when to open the box. And he entered North Korea disguised, under disguise, all this, and it was assigned a communist guide. Well, in the middle of the night, his guide was sleeping. He slipped out to a short village, a village that was maybe a mile or two away, um, where the secret body, the secret church was. And so 
they learned that he was ordained and they all asked to be baptized problem they didn't have running water and they didn't have a creek nearby and so <laughs> this guy gets like a little tub puts them in it and just dunks them in air all right you know <laughs> this is the symbolism we're taught we're you know this is a sim symbolic of the baptism of the heart by the holy spirit so he's like okay i guess i guess this is fine so he prayed over them and they weren't content with just the baptism they wanted to do the Lord's Supper. So they brought out rice cakes and all this, and they're like, well, now we don't have any wine. Now we don't have any, uh, anything to drink with this. And so he said, he was thinking, well, I guess we've had a baptism without water. Like, sure, we can have communion without wine. But he remembered that gift that his friend had packed for him. And of course, opens the suitcase, opens the gift. Well, you know, bottle of wine. Funny how God works like that, right? It's almost like his provision is miraculous. It's almost like they are miracles. And so they all rejoiced. They all wept together and they built one another up. And so I'm going to ask myself this and ask you all this. When it comes to worship, why does it matter how we do it, but rather that we're doing it in based biblically. I don't care if it's just a piano and an organ or if it's an electric guitar, a drum set and fog machine. I don't really care. I just care that it's biblically based and that we're really fellowshipping with one another. Let's focus on the heart, not the outside. We can have our preferences for whatever song, but so long as those songs are biblically based, is it really an issue? Now, let's listen to the word that Christ has given to us and let it dwell and live in our hearts. Now, whatever we do when we go out from this place, let's do it in the likeness and be ambassadors for Christ. And as I move forward in this time, I would have Curtis come up and play, pray, play, play. <laughs> I would have Curtis come up and play. There's a time for prayer and a time to dwell on the word. You don't need to come forward to the altar. You don't need to do anything, but let's remember the word that Christ has given to us. Let's remember to build one another up and to love one another. And if there's anybody who has anything against another, now is the time to get it out of the way. Now is the time to say, hey, it's done. Because Jesus says, before you go and offer your gift, if your brother has aught against you, Go be reconciled to your brother. Luke, if you have ought against your brother, all these things. Let's love one another as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow in your presence today. God, we just thank you for your word and the worship of your name. May you help us, Father, to make application of your truth that we could look more like you and live for you every day of our lives. Lord, we pray that you will lead, guide, and direct us, mold us, and shape us, and make us into the men and women of God that you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
bless you.